Yo, this hot, this the spot, there it is, pod.com. We're interviewing the best comedians, so tune in quick and get your ears receiving them. We're talking about life and life to stream right to you from the microphone right to your home, dude. Side note, this might get embarrassing, but no, don't sweat, yo, because there it is. Welcome to the There It Is Podcast, a comedy podcast for creators of any variety. I'm your host, Jason Farr. Let's do this. Thanks so much for listening, especially if this is your first time listening. If you like the episode, you can check out old ones. They are all available on iTunes and SoundCloud. And you can also read up on old episodes on the website, thereitispod.com. You can go to the blog section and find those. And you can also read up on other items in the blog section. So go check out thereitispod.com and uh, see what you can get into there. And, of course, you can always follow us on social media on both Twitter and Facebook at There It Is Pod. Well, today's episode is a great one. When I started this podcast... And I was just conceptualizing it and figuring out what I wanted it to be. I told myself, well, it would be great to have an SNL writer on. You know, like the SNL is one of my favorite shows ever, if not my most favorite show ever. There were so many people who were on SNL that inspired me. So it was a no-brainer to want to get somebody involved with that show on the podcast. And I finally did. We're having a little chat today with SNL writer Zach Bornstein. He is going into his second season writing for the show, but he's done a ton of other stuff, so we talk about a ton of other things as well, like his working at Jimmy Kimmel Live. He's a director, his time in college. We talk about it all. Why don't we just get right to it? Here is my chat with Zach Bornstein. Thanks so much for being here, Zach. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's go back a little bit to when you got your start in comedy where are you from uh from seattle washington originally Mm -hmm. and comedy start kind of began uh in college there was a lot of groups there but i was always interested in it like my my bar mitzvah was jewish comedian themed so every table was like Adam Sandler, Mel Brooks, or yeah. So I was lame from a very young age. Yeah, <laughs> but you were doing it from a very young age. It sounds like. Didn't yeah, not it. really in earnest until uh-huh. until uh, you know, around eighteen. Uh huh. And where'd you go to college? Uh, to Brown in Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, okay, cool. And and so. What were you doing comedy-wise there? Well, there had a really good comedy scene. It was, it wasn't, it didn't have the like, you know, name recognition as like the Lampoon or anything like that at Harvard. But there was a, um, there was a sketch group that my friend was going to go audition for, and he didn't want to go alone, uh, and so I went with him to audition for it, and just kind of randomly. I kind of fell into the group. It was awkward for a little while because my friend didn't get it. Uh, but uh, so, but that group ended up being super fun, uh, and it was it was called Out of Bounds, mm-hmm. and it was the group where John Krasinski came from and a, and a couple other yeah uh, I've heard of that cool group. comedians. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they so that group it put on a new hour and a half of sketch every month and a half. So for you know, four years, I ended up putting together, you know, a, just a ridiculous amount of sketch content. Mm-hmm. And it was mostly bad. Like, most of what I was writing was really bad. But I think just the <laughs> constant practice of it was yeah. super helpful early on. Oh, yeah. Because I mean, one of the things that people kind of miss when they get into a, the comedy world uh, is that you really have to consistently put out work and yeah uh, you know they may be really funny but they've kind of put themselves in a position uh, and i'm one of these comics that will get on stage and work it out you know but you really have to be kind of consistent at generating material because if you want a career in it you have to work it you have to work it like it's yeah. a job because it's a real job so that's great that you're really getting is. that experience in college yeah, that was nice, and it was 
I think it was just like your percentage gets better as you do it more. So like at the mm-hmm. beginning, if I'd write, you know, 40 sketches and one of them wasn't terrible, by the time I left, maybe I'd write 40 sketches and, you know, eight of them aren't terrible. Right. Just like you, you get your... It was also a lot of fun because the group was really collaborative and nice and you kind of figure out how to work with other people and how to perform. And we kind of unintentionally, like re-deduced the like UCB rules of sketch comedy. And then when I got out of college and went to New York and took a UCB class, it was like everything that we had kind of figured out on our own by doing it. And we are like, oh, well, if we'd just done this first, it would have been much easier. <laughs> That's It shows a lot about the comedy brains you all had to have come up with those tactics, so to speak, before taking a UCB class. Yeah, I think, well, that's very nice. I think it was more also that you you watch a lot of, you know, TV sketch comedy and mm-hmm. it all vaguely has the same rules, so you can kind of re-deduce it yourself. We had like a shitty version of like what was called, what was, ga- what was game, we called them escalating lists, which is a much less sexy name for it. Uh, <laughs> But and maybe like, not no. as like easy to for people to confuse because escalating actually is a good word to put in there when you're talking about comedy and and how to progress. Sure. The scene. <laughs> yeah, and we were a bunch of science nerds in that group. It was like sixty or seventy percent uh, uh, like kids who were studying science and doing pre med and stuff. So right, I think we were we were in the long unnecessarily long phrases. <laughs> were there any specific things that you picked up on that that you could share do you remember i know it may have been long enough ago now that you've done it but do you remember any specifics about what you were picking up on oh man um i think one of the things that helped a lot was realizing that you can have two games going in tandem this is like a real real specific thing for comedy nerds but normally you just have your single game that's going like mm-hmm. one two c exclamation point kind of vibe and then but i realized that you can get twice as many jokes in if you have a second game in tandem that whenever you rest the game like if in your you know whenever you stop in between game beats you can rest the game but if those game rest beats have their own heightening game You can get twice as many laughs out of a sketch. I was actually just thinking about this because I I was in a discussion with my girlfriend about, like, you know, the two games thing. And it spurred this thought of, I guess a game could have, like, an A game, so to speak, and a B game. This is how I was breaking it down. So it may not be correct, but uh, help me out with this. Uh, But there could be, Mm -hmm. like, an A game that's maybe what's the main point of the scene or the main subject matter of the scene. But then you can have, like, a secondary, more character-driven game. You know, like, there's this character does this specific thing when something happens. That's a game in itself that maybe doesn't contradict with the main theme A game, but... You have a B game, you can maybe even have a C game, but that might be juggling too much uh, for the average comedian. But what is, so is that the sort of thing that you were, you guys were figuring out there that you can have like an A game and a B game? Or are you saying there could be? Yeah, I guess equal? so. Was that, there's a conversation you're having with your girlfriend? Uh, she's in comedy too, and uh, oh, gotcha. Yeah, we did a scene together and we both had kind of initiated a game. And uh, so we just had a discussion about, the, like, can you really do that? Is that really something that I see. Out? Was this a relationship <laughs> argument that you guys tried to transition into sketch context? <laughs> well, I think uh, the reverse of that is what happened. <laughs> it became Look, I'm not arguing with you. It's just you have your game. I have my game. <laughs> this is my side Free of the playing room. playing our own thing, but they can interweave. <laughs> <laughs> well yes no but uh I, I think that's cool though that you all were figuring that out so then you go through all those hours of creating sketches and that's a really good point to go back to it for a second about creating so much stuff it's not all going to be good and most of it is not going to be good maybe mm-hmm. you know 
I've heard a few musicians and songwriters talk about this, about uh, they give advice of saying, just write, just keep writing. It doesn't have to be a good yeah. song. Write a song, finish that song, then write another song. You, your hundredth song might be your hit, but you've got to write 99 yeah. songs before you get to that hundredth, you know, like to so just write. Yeah, and I think people are a lot of, or at least I was for sure, scared that for a while that the first one would be bad, so why try? Mm. The first five are going to be bad, so why try? And you just kind of have to break through the, okay, if I perform this and I'm embarrassed in front of my friends, that's not, that's like a necessary step to getting to the hundredth, you know, right, right. sketch. So you graduate, you go to UCB when you move to New York, is it? because you know oh, yeah. that New York is the place to be and or is that because you wanted to have a career like what what exactly was your desire to move to New York City Uh so going to school in Providence almost all my close friends were moving to New York and so as a you know as a real member of a bandwagon I also was hopping on to go there um <laughs> my plan was to I was in, I was a pre-med, so my plan was to take a year off um, before medical school to apply for some uh, research scholarships and stuff like that, try to get some money to be able to afford med school. Uh, and then in that year, uh, I was also, you know, if I'm going to be here for a year, I might as well go whole hog into comedy. And mm-hmm. so... You know, I do stand up every night. I started this group with a couple, a sketch group with a couple friends from school. Um, did UCD classes. Uh, was writing uh, for this like uh, Onion-like paper, um, and so I was like, you know, I may as well try this if I have a year off. Yeah. And then within that, and and then also UCB, of course, you meet a lot of really cool, interesting people who are all coming up at the same time. Mm-hmm. And then in that first year, I, by the end of it, when I was going to start doing the applications, I got a message from Jimmy Kimmel, who had reached out about one of our videos uh, oh, cool. from that sketch group. Um, oh, cool. And then it's. And when was this, then, by the way? Yeah. If I may interrupt. When was this? Oh, no, no worries. I've been, um, that was uh, 2012 uh, into 2013. Okay. And so Jimmy Kimmel reached out to you. Do you remember the what specifically the sketch was, or what it was? We was had this sketch? video. It was this. It was not even like a sketch. It was this mashup of the Cosby theme song with the blur, or the Cosby intro with the blurred lines <laughs> song, which were both popular at the time. It was like one of those just dumb internet mashups, uh-huh. but it it. it it got passed around a lot and also way creepier now in retrospect. This is before right. all the Cosby stuff. This is when blurred lines was the rapey part of that duo. Right. Right. And, and now very much it's transferred to the other, I know. Uh, to Cosby, but, um, which is, makes it way scarier, but yeah. it was getting a lot of play. And then he must have, he saw that. And then from there was clicking around some of the, the group was called garlic Jackson was clicking around, um, some of our videos, we were making, uh, you know, a video or every uh, week um, mm-hmm. through this residency with YouTube. So we had just a lot of material online. Um, and then he just got in touch on Twitter uh, and said he liked the videos. And then we just struck up a conversation and then um, and then things kind of just progressed from there. And um, so what what came directly from the uh, Kimmel discussion? Uh, nothing for about a year or maybe nine months or so. Because mm-hmm. he was the thing about those late night jobs is that people never leave them. Like, it's such a good job. Like, yeah. if, like he, he has a lot of the same writers he had from the man show days um, right. working with him. And it's because, one, he's an awesome boss. Two, it's like a cool show that's always going to get big ratings and be good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a good life. Like you get a decent amount of time off and yada yada. So mm-hmm. there's just like a lot of reasons why you would never, once you get those that a late night job like that, you'd never leave. So there's very few, um, there's very few openings. So I just would keep in touch with him and uh, I, w- I went out to LA to meet him, but there was nothing 
open. And then one of their directors was leaving, um, this guy named Payment Benz, who's absolutely incredible. He went, he was going to go direct for Key and Peele. Mm-hmm. Um, he was leaving and then Jimmy asked me if I wanted to, uh, try directing. So I, uh, for the show. So I, I came out to LA and started doing that. Oh, that's cool. So in what capacity were you direct? Had you done a lot of video direction before? Yeah, I had done, you know, I'd done probably about 40 or 50 for Garlic Jackson, that sketch group. Mm-hmm. I directed for a lot of random, like the way I was paying my rent in those days was a lot of random videos. Like I would do one for, I worked a little bit for the onion, uh, mm-hmm. this, MTVU, which was like this like mm-hmm. sub channel of MTV with the college humor, a lot of these like kind of uh, one off internet videos. Um, did this series for Maker Studios, which is like that YouTube network. So I was doing a lot of these random one offs and just kind of building up material and confidence and yada yada. So I had, ex- I had a decent amount of it, uh, directing experience from that. That's but it was definitely, great. you know. Thanks. It's definitely a big risk on his part. I mean, he didn't know, it was, like, he could have a good, well-known director. Do that job. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a yeah. kudos to him that he's willing to take risks on, on uh, young folks. Oh yeah, I mean, we're really living in a good age for late night talk shows. Um, there, there are oh, a lot yeah. of them, but there are a lot of good ones, you know. And in the early nineties, oh, yeah. they were like two good ones but there were still a lot of (laughs) you know so it's uh yeah it's a good era uh and so that's a good gig to have so you're a really good gig yeah yeah it's super fun because jimmy is also just the nicest like everyone there is just like they're out of love it's a very nice environment oh that's great so what happens next for you you're you're there for how long um i was there for two and a half years Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, I submitted a packet to SNL, and they liked it. And so uh, they, I got a call. They're like, "Hey, from my agent." He's like, "Hey, SNL, like your packet. Can you? They want to fly you out to New York tomorrow." I said, "Oh, I, fuck! I can't. I have a shoot tomorrow. I guess I fucked this opportunity." So. Mm-hmm. But then I got really lucky that one of the head writers was coming out to um, to L.A. to promote a film he had just finished. Mm-hmm. So I met with him, and we hit it off. He was a really good guy. And then there was a guy named Chris Kelly, who's wonderful. The movie was Other People, which mm-hmm. you should really see if you haven't. Uh, okay. It's really good. Other People. With Molly Shannon. Right. Won an Independent Spirit Award. Mm-hmm. It's really good and very emotional but funny and I've heard wonderful things about experiences. It. Yeah, it's really good. And part of this kind of new wave of people just making like a very personal like this is my life film. Yeah. So when you met with him, what did I mean did do do writers regularly have to audition? It's more of a it's just kind of a job interview. Like Okay. I think it's also kind of the asshole test. It's like Pete <laughs> someone's writing can be amazing, but like it's like if you're, can you, are you going to be pleasant to be around at four in the morning? Right. Are you going to be a douche? Are you going to be bad for the culture? Like all that kind of stuff. I think they're trying to get a sense of in an interview. Yeah, for sure. And what was the reason for pitch? Uh, you know, like you, you sent a packet into SNL. Obviously, SNL's a big mm-hmm. deal. It's it's one of the meccas of uh, comedy today mm. so there are obvious reasons why you would want to submit a packet there but you had a good gig going at Kimmel was it that you wanted to go back to New York City or what was the the reason behind it I think you got it <laughs> I think you nailed it all the things you said it just you know it's you, you grow up watching it and yeah I think it's just one of those places that has a spot in everyone's like um, every comedy writer's imagination of you know what if um, right, right. Who was it that inspired I, I, you on the show? Oh, growing man. up, I mean, as a I've kid. been watching it for a long time. It was, I mean, there, there are several I think names. Will, Will Ferrell's probably the, you know, he was, he was really the king of the show for when I was, you know, uh, at that impression for a long time for me. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, yeah. whoever, 
whoever was like the, the lead of the show when you're like, I don't know, 10 to 16, that's who's going to no, be your like comedy icon forever. I've heard Lauren Michaels say that, you know, it's uh, people's favorite era of the show was the ones when they were 14 or something like that. You know, that's yeah, that's, that's everyone's favorite era of the show because that's their coming of age. You know, it makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's a really amazing show with amazing history and you get to be a part of it. And that's super exciting. When you got the message that you passed the asshole test from that interview, I mean, <laughs> how surreal was that? I guess it was pretty surreal. I was I remember I was on the toilet when I got the call, and so I was more just worried about trying to get out of there quietly so it wouldn't be obvious I was on the toilet because there was a very small echoey bathroom. Right, right. You can always say like, "Oh, I and, stepped out into the stairwell." Yeah. I, yeah, so that's what I went to do, but, you know, my pants were down, and you have to flush, <laughs> which is going to make it obvious. So I had to do, like, a flush and sprint to try to get away from the sound of it, and then go, oh, sorry, my phone's breaking for a second, or something like that. Um, <laughs> so, well, that, I remember that was a... Yeah, yeah, I, I think I may have used that as well, but, the, you know, you the pace of the conversation was rapid fire. So you can't right. mute for too long. Oh, that's true. And then <laughs> it's obvious if you mute, cause then the background hum of your background hum will go away for a second. They might think you <laughs> dropped the call. I didn't want to... Yeah, that's true. So. Uh, it's, everyone was stunned in silence. Yeah. yeah. So that must've been, you know, an amazing moment for you. Uh, what's the first call you make after you, you got that phone call? The first call was, it was one of three. It was either my mom, my girlfriend, or my agent. And I remember calling them all right after. And I don't remember in what order. Right. I want, um, I want to say not my agent first, just because that <laughs> makes me seem like a better guy, <laughs> that I would call my mom and my girlfriend first. But I honestly don't remember the order. And I may be just a, uh, a douche who wanted to at least make sure it was real news before it was. Well, you know, I no, remember that's, for a couple, yeah, that's not douchey. If you wanted to make yeah. sure it wasn't a gag, yeah. <laughs> and also, you know, Kimmel's so well known for doing very good gags, so yeah. I didn't know her prank, so I didn't know. I didn't I didn't have any like it was all through a phone call, so I didn't have any paper trail for it. So I remember I woke up the next morning and was like searching my email. I was like, There's no record of this. <laughs> is this possible that this is not actually happening? And I remember that was a thought for a good forty eight hours, is that this isn't this isn't real. Right. And, you know, I imagine it was exciting for everyone for you to get on SNL. But since you had already had the Jimmy Kimmel job, I'm sure you had already made your mom happy that the <laughs> tuition for pre-med did not go fully to waste. They still have their hopes. I remember <laughs> my, my, the first thing I told my mom I was, in, I was going to the show to go right for it. And she said... Oh, that's great. I heard Mount Sinai Medical School likes admitting writers. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, so I think even even in something that seems like it will be a a, a career, it, they they still have their hopes that I'll I'll see the light and make a better decision. <laughs> right. Uh, so you have been there for how long now? Uh, just one season. A great season to start on. I mean, gosh. Uh, that was a, an amazing season that SNL had last year. That must have been doubly exciting. Yeah. It was a ratings juggernaut last year. And then content-wise, I mean, it was one of the most inspired seasons. And this last several years have been very inspired. And oh, you, I guess you got to meet Lin-Manuel Miranda. I mean, it must have been amazing to have su- yeah, surreal it was every very single cool. week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you, it's a bit of an out-of-body experience, but you just try to keep your keep your cool every moment being around those people. Right. Uh, trying not to act like it's such a big deal. Right. <laughs> You're writing constantly, I assume. How much are you putting together, whether it's getting used anywhere or not? Like, how much are you writing? A pretty decent amount. I mean, in a year, I've got to write... On SNL, I was probably writing, you know, two to six sketches a week. Mm-hmm. And then in off weeks, I was working on pilots and stand-up and stuff. 
So I think that quantity has never been a problem oh, for right. me. Well, uh, yeah, it sounds like it from college. Yeah, I just kind of gotten used to that um, to that um, uh, pace of yeah. just like. You're and constantly, yeah, obviously, mo- a ton of it's awful, but, you know, just <laughs> right. at least one in every, you know, however many is, is not as embarrassing. Yeah, and that's part of the reason I want to bring it up is so anyone who's not had a professional life in comedy at all, but they're wanting to get into comedy, uh, just for them to get an idea of just how much content has to be created in order for them to get a finished product. Uh, I mean, it is uh, it is a lot, and you do have to get used to that pace if you want to work professionally, especially in a, a legit show like SNL or whatever is out there that's uh, doing legit shows right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially in the late night world, the, the Kimmel writers are really incredible in how much content they put out. Just because they're they're writing, a, like people, you know, will write a packet for a show, get onto the show, and they have to write a almost as much as a full like as that every single morning Mm. so if you didn't enjoy the process of a packet you were not going to enjoy the process of the show right and that's a really good lesson i think people need to learn uh they want to be able to be kind of one and done like i wrote this sketch and like (laughs) well maybe write a few more (laughs) because that's the job yeah and if it's if and this is really advice for anybody going into any profession. If the work seems tedious and you hate doing the work, it's probably not the right thing for you, no matter what you want out of it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially with sketch and late night, like monologue jokes and stuff like that, just the sheer volume of it is staggering. So like yeah. you can, if you're a screen, if you're a screenwriter, you could write one feature and have a, have a decent career, but just especially in the late night and even UCB world, you got to write a sketch a week if you're in a class or if Mm -hmm. you're on a mod Mm -hmm. team, you got to do at least a sketch a week. So if that's tedious in any way, it's just going to get worse. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question about writing bad stuff. Like you said, a lot of that stuff is going to (laughs) be awful, but how do you power through and just keep writing and not get in your head about it and say to yourself oh this is awful i'm a terrible writer what is it you do um, to get through to the good stuff i guess just keep writing and be like i think what sometimes keeps me going is that i've had things that i thought were awful while i was writing them i was like why am i doing this it's just like but then it went over really well mm-hmm. and then i've had stuff that went that I was like, oh man, this is going to slaughter. This is going to be so good. And then it was terrible. It got, it got crickets. And so I think there's just this, you just got to kind of finish it and mm-hmm. then see how the audience reacts to it. Cause there's, you won't know until you right. put it up in front of people. Yeah. I was just about to ask, like, how do you really know if it's good? Cause there are obviously, and this is for any, anyone who creates stuff, there's a, uh, big gap it seems between what people like and what you think they're going to like sometimes you know Mm -hmm. you can write something and you love it and you put it out and people are just kind of okay with it and then something that you were just okay with you know like you were fine with it you wrote and put it out and everyone just ate it up um of course yeah yeah even legends like louis ck for each hour special he doesn't he doesn't write an hour and it goes into a special he'll write He's going around to clubs every night testing material. Mm-hmm. Does you know ten minutes, keeps one minute of it, and then <laughs> right. and then does another ten minutes, keeps one. Like even I, I, you see legends tell jokes that aren't good. You see, I saw my heroes do terrible sketches on the show, and mm-hmm. that's fine. And or at the table read, and then they do another one, and it's genius. It's just that you have to. No one can bat a hundred percent. Right. It's just, it's just not something that uh, is possible. And even, uh, it seems like that's commonly known, or should be commonly understood. As reasonable of, of a point that is, it seems like the average person still does not understand that you can't bat a hundred. Um, yeah. But, you know, like, I guess they're so used to growing up on watching someone's hour special that when they see them just pop in uh, at a place to work out material, they 
you're like, oh, it wasn't so good. It's like, well, they were working on it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like I think the people who do well, the folks who are willing to be embarrassed and then yeah. just push through. Any, I, this guy, Andy Breckman, who created Monk. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Listening to a, he's a great guy, and I was listening to a podcast with him, and he was telling... Um, He's telling uh, the best show that he found that the people who are okay being embarrassed, once you're like, okay to be embarrassed, once you go, I'm, it's not going to ruin me. I'm not going to kill myself being embarrassed. I'm going to survive it in front of my friends and people who Mm -hmm. respect me. Once you're okay with that, the world really opens up for you because then you're willing to try things that might seem like they could be embarrassed. I mean, I, I, I've been embarrassed more times than I can remember, but it's just that, you know, I, people tend to forget those. People just remember the good ones. Right. This is such a good part of this conversation. All of it's been fun for me, but this I really want to... <laughs> the rest of it was an utter nightmare, but at least I found... I hate it. I finally... Uh, 40 minutes in it just... No, but seriously... Um, I really love this because uh, I, I keep coming back to this for a couple of reasons. One, I heard this great thing that Stephen Colbert said he learned at Second City about learning to love the bomb, that you have to learn to love the, love those moments on stage just so you can perform and get through it. If you hate those moments and you're not, you're not really doing the show anymore, you know, like you have to keep mm-hmm. your head in the game. But for me, I've never been one to get super embarrassed on stage or nervous about getting on stage but there's enough of a a fear of embarrassment that i am not open up enough and so i want to figure out how to get there because i i go to stand up open mics here and that's the common problem so people will do a joke it doesn't go over well and they all go like i'm working on that one or oh you guys really oh you guys really don't like this tonight you know it's like it's an open (laughs) mic it's an what do you think an open mic is for you know and i but i get up there too and maybe i don't say that stuff but i don't go as far out as i would like to i don't perform the way i'd like to i don't try things as openly as i'd like to and all of the great people that you can see they lack that concern yeah they're humans still they're not superhuman, but it's a confidence thing and a, and a fearlessness mm-hmm. to a certain degree for some people. How do, do you develop that? Is there a way to, obviously you develop that by going on stage a bunch, but mm-hmm. is there a mental place you can get at and focus on being at each time you go on stage so that you can get over that? You know, I wish I could say I'm like, you know, I'm impervious to that, but I also, you know, will climb up if something doesn't go great. But I think you have to have, I mean, just speak generally, I think, I think to do well, you have to have a certain delusion to go, (laughs) oh my, I just bombed, but I know it's funny. I know Mm -hmm. something that all these people don't know. And that's crazy. That's a stupid delusional (laughs) thing to think, but you have to think it to do well in comedy. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you want to respond to what the audience likes, but if you do poorly, you have to go. Well, I I know I can, I know I'm still funny, so next time I'll try to do better. Mm-hmm. Which is like, I don't know. It's cr- it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have a room full of people going, "Don't do this." Oh yeah, you're it's not a, funny. Right. Stop telling jokes, and you're like, I'm gonna keep telling jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Or like even when crazy people would go on do. American Idol, you know, like people who couldn't sing or were not great mm. would go on there thinking, yeah. not only should I be on this show, but I am the American Idol. I deserve <laughs> all of the attention and the million dollars that it gets. And there's this thin yeah. line between being the star who has the right amount of confidence and being a complete crazy person who's, yeah. who's too yeah. delusional but uh, you know they're so similar i don't know if there's any thinner line <laughs> between uh, it's hard between to tell things. i mean I would, it's really hard to tell because sometimes you are to have that delusion but you just don't have the talent to back it up but some mm-hmm. like but well, there are people like hannibal burris who you hear stories about him starting out in the chicago comedy scene and he'd go on stand-up show after stand-up show and just bomb like people hated him mm-hmm. like he was just really really bad and then all of a sudden he just started, but he just like kept going up and mm-hmm. then he became like, he's one of the best standups working today. Yeah. 
One of the most interesting He just found something. Minds, yeah. Yeah. So he, it just depends when you go on American Idol. <laughs> right. Right. How many hours did you really put in? It's kind of like what we were saying about writing so much until you get to that good thing. Yeah. Like you're... And I guess you're, you're, you're trying yeah, to forward. discover something in both cases. You're either trying to discover yeah. who you are and how you present yourself and how you present stuff when you're performing on stage or when it's just like writing a bunch of stuff until you figure out an avenue that really works for you. Mm -hmm. It's just that you have to have the same delusion to get to your 100th sketch, but there will be people who write 100 sketches and they're not good. Right. Like, I guess it's not, I guess that's kind of a sad part of it is that it's not 100% that you'll, that everyone will unlock this genius within them. Right. I, and I think there are a lot of people That's a who, shitty thing to say. That's a sad well, thing to say, but I, I, maybe it just means you have to do 200 sketches. I don't think it's malicious. I think, I think it's a fair thing to say from this point of view that there are your geniuses and there are people who are not geniuses, but there are successful people in both sides of that. There are people who have mm -hmm. figured out how to... They've just figured out how to do something. It's not that they're particularly talented or that they are particularly original, which mm -hmm. I think is what a genius is, is someone who is just so original at fig and they figured out something that other people hadn't figured out or they think in such a way that other people just don't think that way. You know, like Chris Rock or Louis C.K. Like they, how many people think like them? I mean, that's, they are where they are because nobody thinks like them. But yeah. then you have people who, they're not that interesting of thinkers like people we've named, but... <laughs> They know how to present something. They know how to plot it together and it still be a success, still be correct, you know, still be right or still be good. And uh, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily amazing, but hey, they know how to make it. I think there are people who will write 100 sketches or, or go up and do stand-up 100 times in a row and or however many times and... They just don't seem to be getting better, and it might just be what they're focusing on, that they're not, they're just not learning anything. And I could pick up a guitar and just start flinging away at the strings, but if I'm not learning how to play chords, I'm never really going to learn how to play guitar. Yeah, and there's also ways to make your practice time more efficient, like that you're saying. That the, right. You could write 100 sketches, but if you're not learning from each one, you could be just flying in the wrong direction. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like Shaq and free throws. Practicing the wrong yeah. form real hard, but it's the wrong form. Is there any advice that you could give someone who's starting out, maybe they're struggling at trying to write better, uh, any advice uh, for for them? Is it is there a book they could read? Or are there uh, classes they could take? What, what can they do? I would say that something that helps is to take ECB classes. That's like the biggest thing I always recommend because they really do. There really is a formula to it that you can learn. Mm -hmm. And pe some people that go to UCB and they're like, well, you know, these people are doing well, but you know, I'm, I'm not. So fuck them. They don't really know. I think the people who are doing well, there are doing well for a reason. Like it's, it's, they're good and they, they're trying really hard. And I think like tr try to work with those people mm -hmm. rather than get mad at them or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that certainly helps. I think that just watch as much comedy as you can and try to mind the rules of it because there are rules to it. Mm -hmm. I would say, oh, I think the biggest thing is forcing yourself to do a show. Like you can do because that will get and then invite all your friends, invite all your friends and all your family because that's going to put some fear into you that you don't want to be embarrassed. Mm hmm. That's probably, I remember that's when I felt like I was getting good is that I knew, not that I'm like amazing, but I remember the feeling of wanting to get good was like, okay, I know I'm going to have a hundred of my friends and family and strangers at this show. If it sucks, I'm going to be embarrassed. So I did everything I could preparing for that show, staying up night after night, making things better, working on yada yada, just trying to not be embarrassed. So I think if you just write sketches it's not it's you're not going to have as much fire under your ass to make yourself to force yourself to make them better 
as if you write sketches and then put them up. Mm-hmm. That's like, good go, do the jams at UCB, get a show at the pit, do like anything you can to put them up. Awesome. That's, that's really solid advice. I appreciate you sharing it. Yeah. Well, I Fuck yeah. Feel- <laughs> oh, man, that was a close call. I almost blew it. <laughs> So we're at the end here, I'd say. Um, we could create oh, okay. something. Uh, I do oh, sure. w- I do want to ask, uh, real quick before we try to create something, if there was a, a particular moment, I don't know if it was getting to see a, a band perform or meet somebody, was there a particular moment that just stands out as just uh, something amazing from for you from this past season of SNL? Probably one of my favorite moments was getting to write with the host because they come around to the offices and you have a chance to write with them. Mm -hmm. So there was one sketch that I wrote with Aziz Ansari and Alan Yang, who he made Master of None with. Mm -hmm. And those are guys I had looked up to for a long time. Mm -hmm. And they came in and we, along with Alex Moffat, the four of us wrote a sketch together. And just pitching ideas with them, hearing them like laugh, and then us kind of working out the things and... Just that was a real treat because it's someone I had looked up to yeah. for so long and to be able to have, you know, to just have my ideas go, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, let's put that in. Or maybe or they point, pitch a joke. Oh, maybe that doesn't work. Just having going, oh, these are real people who are, I don't know. I think you yeah. get it. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> They're real fantastic. people doing it. That was a great yeah, episode, that was too. Satisfying. Oh, yeah, that was a, he's amazing. He's, Yo, and yeah. Alan is. Well, and well. and he and I both are from South Carolina, so. Look at that! You should bring it up. <laughs> with him. So yeah, let's try to create something. What's something that you would want to create? Like try to figure out here. Well, what's your what's your sketch? What's your sketch group? I'm not. I know you're doing group. something with your. But you oh. were. You said you were doing sketches with your girlfriend. Oh, we back home. We did some uh, sketch stuff, and uh, here we both are just kind of taking improv classes. So we don't have a sketch. Oh, group. oh, I see. <laughs> what was the thing with the dual games then? Was that an improv scene where you guys both an in improv. a stage or something? Yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 yeah. I guess this all applies to improv as well. You've worked on sketches, uh, sketch teams, obviously sketch show. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there an angle? that a sketch team should try to come up with to direct themselves oh. and focus themselves? Um, I've only been part of sketch groups that are just kind of like a shotgun blast in terms of uh. what you're allowed to do. Like it's more of a, like more like SNL where anything could fly. Of course there are sketch groups mm-hmm. that are more like Key and Peele or Amy Schumer where there is kind of a, uh, a theme or a perspective to the show that all the sketches kind of in some way or another fit into that. Although Key and Peel and Amy Schumer also just did Evergreen uh, other stuff too. Right, right. Um, it did seem to fit but, a certain sensibility though. Yeah. I think a good way to do it is, I mean, I always carry a notebook in my back pocket and anytime mm-hmm. there's something funny, I'll kind of write it down. And I think one thing that I remember helping a lot, okay, this might be helpful, is that people would come with pitches to meetings. Mm-hmm. And you kind of talk about them. And anytime someone says a pitch and then other people start riffing on that pitch, mm-hmm. like it's very easy to come up with jokes. Like it's like you say something and all of a sudden people are going, oh, well, then what uh, this pitch and this pitch and this pitch. Once there's an idea that feels easy or fertile, mm-hmm. I've heard it say from that, you should follow that. If it's if it's fun, like if it's if it's fun as a group to pitch on, then that's probably a decent idea. Or okay. at least something that's worth exploring. I like that. How about I call it There It Is? That's, uh, I think, good info and a good way to figure out how to move forward in uh, creating ideas and pitching them. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks so much for being oh, on, thank the, you. on the podcast. Yeah, of course. You're a very nice guy. I hope, oh, uh, I hope I'm talk soon. What a great chat, right? He knows so much about comedy. He's done so much. He's got some fun stuff in there. So I hope you enjoyed that. But I also hope, as always, you learned from it as well. If you want to see more or learn more about Zach Bornstein, you can go to his website, bornsteinzach.com. And, of course, the link to that is in the bio. From there, you can find his social media accounts. But pretty much just go to any of them. Twitter, Instagram, and search for at Zach Bornstein and you'll find him. 
You can also find us on social media. Go to Twitter and Facebook at There It Is Pod. So please do that. You can find me on Twitter at Jason Farr Jokes and on Instagram at Jason Farr Picks. Well, folks, that is today's episode. Next week, another fun one. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be good to each other. The music for the theme song was created by Neil Brooks. The rap was written and performed by Nick Acevedo. The logo for There It Is was created by Jeff Prater. The There It Is podcast is produced by Jason Farr.